think it's time to start. Yeah. So there's one person missing, huh? Or maybe they will come late. Okay. So today we're going to talk about Weidman Staten, right? So we've covered martensite, we've covered uh, bainite, and we are now raising the temperature to Weidman Staten ferrite, okay? So notice that I've identified Weidman Staten ferrite to be in the displacive transformation curve, okay? And uh, we'll review the evidence which suggests that. So just to remind you, the difference between a reconstructive and a displacive transformation is that if we have a mixture of two different kinds of atoms, in a displacive transformation, you have a one-to-one -one atomic correspondence between the parent and product lattices, okay? Uh, and because you change the pattern in which the atoms are arranged, you get a macroscopic change in shape. Yep. And that macroscopic change in shape is large, so you get a lot of strain energy. So this is a strain energy dominated transformation. And furthermore, the composition of the product phase uh, will not be that given by equilibrium because there is no diffusion of atoms during a displacive transformation. In a reconstructive transformation, you break all the bonds and you arrange the atoms into the new crystal structure, but you maintain the external shape. Okay? And you can imagine a reconstructive transformation happening uh, in two stages. Okay? First is you displace, then you take this triangle here, transfer it onto this side, and that is the diffusion, which means that you do not get a buildup of strain energy. Okay? So it's like water freezing in a container. There's no change in shape of the container, apart from a volume change. And at the same time, there's an opportunity to diffuse atoms, to partition atoms between the parent and product phases to locations where they prefer to be. Okay? So there's a mixing up of atoms, and therefore there's no atomic correspondence between the parent and product phases. So these are the two kinds of transformations that I've talked about, and you can describe them in a slightly different way. Yeah? Many of the men over here have done military service, right? When you're standing in a, a line and you're ordered to board a bus, you do so in a disciplined manner. You, you don't rush towards the bus and just occupy any space you like. Yeah? So this is like a queue of soldiers, and when they board the bus, they board it in exactly the same order. So I know that this soldier here will be next to this soldier here. So a displacive transformation is a military transformation. They will be forced to sit next to each other whether they like to sit there or not. There's no choice, there's no diffusion. Okay? So that's a military transformation. In contrast, this is a civilian transformation where we have a queue of civilians. When the bus comes, they all rush onto the bus and sit next to their friends. So there is very little strain energy. Yeah? But we've lost the atomic correspondence here. Now, there is a third kind of transformation. So military is highly disciplined. Okay? Civilian is uh, you know, chaotic. chaotic. So I went on a bus, actually, to the beach from here. And I could not get out of the bus because the driver was so fast. So we had to rush towards the entrance, push past each other to actually get out of the bus. So that's a civilian transformation. Okay? The third kind of transformation is paramilitary. A paramilitary force is slightly disciplined and slightly not disciplined. Okay? So to illustrate that, this is a paramilitary transformation where you can see we have some small atoms here. Okay? The large atoms are displaced into the new structure. That means you know, they move on the bus in a disciplined manner. Whether they like it or not, they sit next to their uh, neighbors in the queue. But the small atoms misbehave and occupy whatever space they like to occupy. So these are the interstitial atoms, which can diffuse much faster than the substitutional atoms, like iron or manganese. So, you can get a crystal structure change in which the substitutional lattice is displaced, but the interstitial atoms are free to move about and partition between the phases. Okay? So that's what we call a para-equilibrium transformation. Okay? That's where the term para-equilibrium comes from. 
is that you have species of atoms which can move extremely rapidly and they will equalize their chemical potential even though the large atoms are displaced in the position. And because they are interstitial atoms, they don't influence the crystal structure. Okay? So the crystal structure is still deformed, but the small atoms diffuse. And Wiedmannstein ferrite is a transformation like that. Uh, you will see that Wiedmannstein ferrite can grow at temperatures which are well above T0. Okay? That means it's impossible, thermodynamically impossible, for it to form without diffusion of carbon. Yeah? So it's a displacive transformation, but it occurs at a rate controlled by the partitioning of carbon between the ferrite and the austenite. So you can imagine it as a slow displacive transformation. So when we were talking about martensite, I said that martensite does not always have to form rapidly, right? It can, you can watch it forming like in a shape memory metal. Yeah. So a displacive transformation where the substitutional pattern of atoms is changed by a deformation, but the small atoms partition because there isn't enough driving force to support a diffusion-less transformation. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, well, the ferrite that forms can never have an excess of carbon. It's forming well about T0 temperature. So the displacements must occur at a rate controlled by the partitioning of carbon. We will go into that in more detail shortly. Okay, so this is what uh, Wiedmannstein ferrite looks like schematically. You have your austenite grain structure, and these are thin wedge shaped plates which grow from the austenite grain boundaries. Okay? When they grow directly from the austenite grain boundaries, they're called primary Wiedmannstein ferrite. But sometimes you have other kind of ferrite at the grain boundaries, and they can also grow from those ferrite grains, in which case that's called secondary Wiedmannstein ferrite. So this is not important. I'm just explaining to you the morphology of Wiedmannstein ferrite. And there's nothing to stop them from growing right across the grain boundary. It's forming at a high temperature, so the amount of dislocation generation is relatively small because the austenite is extremely weak. So the dislocation density will be quite small compared with bainite or martensite. But this is only diffusion of carbon atoms, not of substitutional atoms. So Wiedmann-Sand ferrite cannot grow across austenite grain boundaries, just like bainite or martensite. Yeah? There's a disciplined movement of the large atoms. The difference in the diffusion coefficient between iron and carbon at these sort of temperatures is eight orders of magnitude. Yeah? Now, this is what it looks like in an optical micrograph. And the first thing you should notice, of course, is the scale. But the second thing you should notice is that the plates don't appear dark. What does that indicate? Hmm? Yeah, there no cementite and there is no particular structure inside those plates. Yeah? And therefore, they etch white. Therefore, you can distinguish Wiedmannstein ferrite from bainite. Bainite has very fine plates, which you cannot resolve optically. And there, there's material between the plates, which is attacked by etchants, so it appears dark. Wiedmannstein ferrite, you, know, you can see a dramatic difference there. Yeah? Etches white. But it, and its shape is in the form of uh, thin wedges. Now, we've looked at uh, displacements. And in the case of martensite, we used interference microscopy because the plates were coarse. And it was Nomaski interference microscopy, where the colors represented the displacements. Okay? Then we looked at bainite, where we needed a much higher resolution because the individual plates are very thin. And what technique did we use? Yeah, you're on the right track. Atomic force microscopy, yeah? Uh, very, very simple 
but very high resolution technique to look at the displacements. And these are two other techniques. If you put a scratch on your sample and you have a displacive transformation, then the scratch will be deflected. Okay, just like when an earthquake ha happens and you've got a row of trees, they will be displaced. Yes, so if you look at images of the fault in San Andreas in the US, you can see a displacement. Yeah? It's a shear deformation. Uh, so these are scratches which you know, we put deliberately, all right? not, not because we haven't polished properly. And you can see that they are being displaced. Okay? And they are in contact at this point where we have the interface between the Wiedemann-Staten ferrite and the austenite, which means that it's like a shear. Okay? Uh, the other technique is another optical interference microscopy technique, which is called Tolansky interference, where effectively you produce fringes. And the fringes act like scratches, so you can see that they are displaced by the formation of Wiedemann-Staten ferrite. Okay? Right. Now, what is the magnitude of the strain energy typically associated with the shape change? Do you remember from your Martin Side lectures? Sorry? Say it louder. Uh, that's the shear strain, but what about the energy? strain energy. You are right, 0.26 is the shear strain. Yeah, yeah, it's quite large. It's uh, of the order of six, 700 joules per mole, right? Now, if you are forming Wiedemann-Staten ferrite at a high temperature, there's no way you have a driving force which is that large. So something is not right here. We are seeing displacements, but they cannot be like martensite because you know, the energy would simply be too large. We can form Wiedemann-Staten ferrite even at a driving force of about 50 joules per mole, whereas the strain energy due to the shape change is much larger, right? OK, so just to summarize, uh, Wiedemann-Staten ferrite can grow at very small undercoolings below the A3 <coughs> temperature, you know, well, well above T0. Uh, at temperature as well about T0. So there's absolutely no question. You cannot have a diffusion-less transformation. Okay. The partitioning of carbon allows the transformation to happen at a higher temperature than T0 yeah, because carbon doesn't want to be in the ferrite. Uh, carbon diffusion is essential during transformation. Now, how do we cope with this strain energy due to the displacive transformation. Well, this is, this is what a shape deformation would look like if it was martensite or bainite, that you have this shear deformation. Right? But in fact, when we look at the detail of the shape uh, change due to Wiedemann-Stern ferret, it is like a tent. That means two shears. Right? So here's one plate of Wiedemann-Stern ferret and another. Now, why does it happen like that? They basically cancel out, yeah? Almost cancel out each other's strain energy. And there's a boundary in between, right? So given that the habit plane, the orientation relationship, and the shape deformation are mathematically connected, if one side has a different shape change to the other side, then the habit planes are different, OK? So, this, for example, is 558 gamma, close to 558, whereas this is another crystallographic variant, which is 585 gamma. That means there's an angle there. And that is the reason why it grows as a triangular shape. Okay? It's actually two plates forming simultaneously, accommodating each other's shape deformation. So they partly cancel out the strain energy. Now, is there any disadvantage of two plates growing together? Uh, they have to grow together. Yes, you're right. No, no. Uh, there's no need for intersection. They both can grow, right? Yeah. OK, if they impinge. But uh, what is the disadvantage of the need for two plates to grow together. 
Say if I asked you to go to the shop, yeah, you can pick your own time and go to the shop, right? You always need a partner. So if you need it to go with several people, you have to coordinate your movements, right? Similarly, you have to nucleate two plates simultaneously. Now that, you can imagine, reduces the probability of nucleation, right? Now what happens if you reduce the probability of nucleation? What will your, how will your structure change? To get a fine ferrite grain size, yeah, you will necessarily have fewer nuclei and therefore the structure will be coarse. Yeah? So, Wittgenstein ferrite is not good for steels. It is a coarse structure and compared with fine structures, it has a poor toughness. Okay? And furthermore, inside these coarse grains, you don't have much structure and therefore, you know, a cleavage crack path can go across the plate without any deflection, any significant deflection. Okay? So the need to accommodate strain energy by two plates growing together in and cancelling out each other's shape change reduces the probability of nucleation because you have to form two of these together. Yeah? When we have enough free energy to account for the strain energy, they prefer to form by themselves here. Okay? So if we look at this, we should be able to find a boundary. And this is a transmission electron micrograph of what optically would appear as a single plate. Okay. And you can clearly see that there is a low misorientation boundary between the two. Low misorientation means a low energy boundary because these two plates which happen to accommodate have similar orientation, not the same, they cannot have the same but similarly oriented in space. So there's a low angle boundary when you look at it, this in a transmission electron micrograph. Okay? So the key distinction to answer your question in the first lecture yeah, between Wiedmannstein ferrite and bainite and martensite is that Wiedmannstein ferrite requires the diffusion of carbon and it requires the growth of two plates simultaneously in order to accommodate the shape change and therefore it's a coarse microstructure Edges white. Okay? There's no, not much of an internal structure inside an optically visible plate of Wiedemann ferrite. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. So, um, so if there is sufficient driving force, for diffusion-less transformation and the nucleation of bainite, then bainite will form preferentially because it's faster. Yeah? Bainite is not thermodynamically favored compared with Wiedemann ferrite because it absorbs the carbon. Yeah? But kinetically it's favored. Yeah? So, yeah, yeah, so it's not, uh, kinet uh, it's not thermodynamically favored. Martensite is not thermodynamic. So none of these appear on a phase diagram, which is an equilibrium phase diagram. Yeah? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, ask so question. Uh, and green, and yeah, no difference, just the nucleation site. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. So, um, because it's a displacive transformation, there will be a very tight orientation relationship between austenite and Wiedmannstein ferrite. If that sort of an orientation relationship exists between what you call ferrite and austenite, then only it can nucleate Wiedmannstein ferrite. Okay? So when ferrite forms at an austenite grain boundary, it has a good orientation with one side, but not with the other. So you get Wiedmannstein plates from one side. Yeah? Yeah. Right, now we are going to do uh, a little bit of mathematics, right? but it's very easy mathematics and we'll be repeating this for different kinds of transformations as we go up in temperature, right? So here is a phase diagram where this is ferrite, this is austenite and C bar as usual is our average carbon concentration, right? And we are looking at a particular temperature 
And this is called a tie line because it links the equilibrium composition of ferrite with the equilibrium composition of austenite. And the terminology here is that this is the composition of austenite that is in equilibrium with ferrite. And this is the composition of ferrite that is in equilibrium with austenite, the solubilities, right? When you talk about the solubility of sugar in tea, yeah, you cannot just talk about the solubility of tea. It's sugar in combination with tea. Yeah? So here we have ferrite in contact with austenite, and those are the equilibrium compositions of ferrite and austenite, and this is the average. So the maximum amount of carbon that the austenite can hold is this, right? So if you've got carbon being pushed ahead of the ferrite as it grows, then at the point where they're in contact, this will be the concentration. Okay, so here, Z star is the length of our Wiedemann-Stern ferrite plate. Okay, the dimension. You can see that the maximum amount that the austenite can hold is C gamma alpha. And the plate can only grow further if the concentration here is reduced by diffusion along here. Okay, uh, that's what we mean by diffusion control growth is that going down that gradient which controls the growth rate. And this is the solubility of carbon in ferrite. And we are not, uh, we do not absorb any excess than given by the phase diagram because we are well above the T0 temperature. Okay? So this concentration profile here comes directly from the phase diagram. Yeah, happy with that? And delta Z over here is a diffusion distance. And I've simplified this picture dramatically because I'm drawing a straight line here. This is called the Zener approximation. But in fact, this would be an error function. But trust me that nothing much is different in terms of what we are going to learn. So why not just use a straight line for simplification, right? Everyone happy with this? Okay, so we are going to derive an equation for the diffusion control growth of a plate of Wiedemann sand ferrite. You know, how does Z star increase with time at a constant temperature? Okay? And we will assume that this concentration doesn't change. The far field concentration, C bar, doesn't change. Uh, you know, e eventually it must change because you're pushing more and more carbon into the material, but let's assume that we are only growing the first plate of Wiedemann Staden ferrite. Okay? Right, so this is our concentration profile again. And when the plate grows, the whole of this profile will be displaced to a different position. Right? Z star will increase. Like that. Yeah? So how much carbon so assume that this distance is very small. How much carbon has been pushed into the austenite? Can you just look at that diagram and tell me? So previously, you see this region contained all this carbon, right? But it has been pushed because it's now C alpha gamma. So what's that value? Yeah. Say it louder, yeah. Gamma alpha minus? Uh, no, no, uh, so it's this. This is the concentration along here, and this is the distance. Yeah? So how much carbon have we pushed? Yeah, it's C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma times the distance moved, right? So. This is the rate at which solute is pushed ahead of the boundary. It's C gamma alpha here minus C alpha gamma times the rate at which the interface moves. So Z star is the position of the interface, and DZ star over DT is the velocity of the interface, right? So this is the rate at which solute is pushed. And remember I told you that C gamma alpha cannot be exceeded because that's the solubility of carbon in austenite, which is in contact with ferrite. So the thing that limits the partitioning of carbon 
is that you must take it away by diffusion, right? So this term must be equal to the rate at which diffusion happens in the austenite ahead of the interface. Okay, so let's just see. Everyone happy with this, first of all? Yeah, the rate of partitioning of carbon. This is the diffusion flux down this gradient. Okay, so this is basically Fix's first law, where we have the diffusion coefficient, and this is the gradient over here. Okay, and the minus sign simply comes from the fact that this gradient itself is negative. Yeah, the carbon is decreasing as the distance increases, so the gradient is negative, right? So this is the diffusion flux from this point onwards. That must equal the rate at which we are partitioning carbon. Okay. So I set the two terms to be equal. This is the rate of solute partitioning, and this is the flux of carbon away from the interface. Nothing complicated. I'm going to approximate this gradient because we have a straight line here as C gamma alpha minus C bar divided by the distance delta Z. We don't know what delta Z is, but this is the gradient at the interface. So I can just write this equal to this. All right. So that's basically saying that the conditions at the interface must be maintained constant. OK, so uh, this, is, this is the shape of a plate in three dimensions. Okay? You can think of it as a parabolic cylinder, which extends uh, into uh, the depth. And the parabolic cylinder is defined by its tip radius, the radius at the tip over here. Okay? That's a mathematical definition of a parabolic cylinder. Uh, so when this plate grows longer, uh, obviously carbon is going into the austenite all around it. Yeah? But the plate is also moving forward. So the diffusion distance remains constant because carbon is being left behind. It's not building up in front of the interface. right? And we can approximate the diffusion distance by the radius here. Okay? So what we are doing is we are saying delta Z can be set equal to the tip radius R right, of the plate. That remains constant because the plate is advancing into fresh austenite as it grows and leaving the carbon behind. Okay. So here is again our equation from the rate of partitioning being equal to the rate of diffusion. And if I rearrange that equation, and set dz star or dt as the lengthening rate of the plate, yeah? then that's equal to the diffusion coefficient, the terms from the phase diagram, the average concentration in your steel, and this diffusion distance, which I'm approximating as the radius of the tip of the plate. Okay? So there are rigorous solutions to this, but we don't need to go into those. So what you find is that the velocity is actually not a function of time here. In other words, the plate is going to grow at a constant rate. Okay? If you are watching it grow, its rate will be constant. Everyone happy with this? OK. So I'm going to uh, now plot this graph. If I plot the velocity versus the tip radius, I get a function like this. In other words, I haven't got a unique velocity. I've got velocity as a function of the radius of the tip. What I really need to calculate the microstructure is the tip radius, right? But there's nothing at all in this which gives me information on what should be the tip radius of the blade. Hmm? Yeah, so if you look at this function, if I set the radius as zero, then I get infinite velocity, which is not correct, right? So something is missing from this analysis. 
And this is a classical problem, not just for Wiedemann-Staden ferrite, but many issues in metallurgy or materials, where you can derive a function of velocity versus radius, but not the actual velocity. Right? Uh, so dendritic solidification is an example. And any growth of a particle which is n doesn't involve a flat interface. Right? So there's something missing. You know, the plates don't grow at an infinite rate. If I set the radius to zero, I'll get the velocity as infinite, right? And what's happening is that imagine you have a, uh, a sphere. As the sphere grows, of course, you are getting more transformation. But what else are you doing? Are you losing some energy somewhere? Hmm? Yeah, you are creating a bigger surface, right? And that cost of creating a bigger surface actually stops the velocity from going to infinity, right? So that's an effect which we call capillarity. That means when you have a small particle and it grows bigger, the cost of interface is very large compared with the volume you transformed. As the particle gets bigger, uh, that cost reduces. Okay? So we need to take account of that. So if I just go back uh, one slide, uh, this is our parabolic cylinder okay, with a tip radius r. And I'm just going to work out in a very elementary way the increase in area when you add one atom, the plate of Wiedemann Sand Ferrite. All right? So very, very simple analysis where we imagine that tip with a radius r and the plate is like this. And let's say the length here is l. And this is the tip radius. I want to work out how much the area increases when I add one atom of iron to this cylinder. Okay? So I need uh, the change in area as a function of radius. And I need the change in volume as a function of radius. And then I can find out the change in area when I add one atom. That means the volume of one atom. Okay? And then if I multiply that by interfacial energy, that tells me the free energy cost of creating new surface, right? Interfacial energy times the change in area when I add one atom. Okay, so I'll go through this step by step. Very, very simple geometry tells me that dA by dr is 2 pi L because, you know, the circumference there is what? 2 pi R. So if you differentiate that, you get uh, two pi, if you, 2 pi r l will give us the area, yeah? circumference times the length of the cylinder. So if I differentiate that, I get 2 pi l. Similarly, the change in volume will be um, this um, circumference, 2 pi r, times dr, the change in radius. So we have 2 pi r, l, and dr here. Okay? So that's the uh, rate at which volume changes with radius. So if I use these two, I get the change in area per volume is dependent on 1 upon r. Makes sense. You know, when, when it's a very thin cylinder, there will be a big change in area yeah, with radius. When it's a very large cylinder, it's not much of a difference. Okay? So if I now set, what is the smallest change in volume? Hmm? One, atom. one atom, if I add one atom. Yeah? So if I replace this by the atomic volume, then I get the change in area when I add one atom to the material. So here, here it is. This is the change in area when I add one atom for a given radius. So this is exactly this equation, but I've replaced dV here by the volume per atom here. And this is just the R, and this is the change in area when I stick one atom onto the Wiedemann-Staden ferrite. Yeah? Happy with that? OK, so if that is the change in area, what is the change in energy? Multiply by the interfacial energy per unit area, right? Here you go. This is the change in free energy when I add a single atom 
to the Wiedemann farad where that is the interfacial energy per unit area. Right? And that is the cost that we must account for. And that should lead us to a function which doesn't give you infinite velocity at zero radius. So that is the cost which we call capillarity, right, after Gibbs Thompson, uh, of increasing the area when you add an atom to the material. Okay, is everyone happy so far? Okay, so this is the cost of adding an atom and increasing the area. And this is the free energy change when we have a flat interface. So if you have a flat interface moving, then there's no increase in area. So there's, there's no cost. So that is the maximum free energy change that you can have when you transfer one atom from austenite to ferrite. Yeah? per atom, and this is the actual value because we have to account for this cost of creating a little bit of interface, right? So this is where the curvature is infinite, that means the radius is infinite, it's a flat interface, and this is for a finite radius here, the free energy change per atom of fer uh, iron transferred from austenite to ferrite. So we are reducing the available free energy change by creating interface. Okay, so I'm just going to manipulate this a bit. Uh, obviously, in this equation, if I make my radius very, very small, then all of this will disappear, and delta GR will be zero. So that radius where all the free energy is consumed in making the interface is called the critical radius, right? So if I set delta GR to zero, then delta G infinity is simply equal to this term where this is now the critical radius at which there is no driving force and therefore the plate will not grow. So Below a certain radius, there is no growth rate. Okay? So the curve we had like that must do that. Right? At the critical radius, the velocity will become zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute this back in here because I know what delta G infinity is if I know the critical radius. Right? So here... This is uh, the new equation for delta GR, where this is delta G infinity, yeah, because we've got a critical radius here. And this is the usual cost when R is greater than RC. And that is exactly the same as this, right? It's just a rearrangement. So this is the free energy available if the radius is infinite. And this is the free energy available if the radius is finite. So the ratio over here is basically telling us the ratio of the free energy of a finite tip radius to an infinite tip radius. So if I take this ratio and simply multiply it by the velocity we had previously, then that gives me the right function. Okay. So here we are. This was the equation we derived earlier by looking at the rate at which solute is partitioned ahead of the interface, balancing it with uh, the rate at which it's taken away by diffusion. And we simply scale that by this because when the tip radius becomes equal to the critical radius, there is no growth. All the free energy is consumed in creating interface. Right? So you can never get a radius which is below the critical radius. If I now plot this as a function of r, then clearly it cannot simply go up, right? It's got, it's got to go up and then down again, because below a certain size, the cost of creating interface pushes it downwards until you get a zero growth rate 
at this value. Okay? So the actual function is like this. And this is true if you think about dendritic solidification or if you think about the interlamellar spacing of perlite. Yeah? You know, perlite can grow rapidly if the interlamellar spacing is zero. But you have to create many, many interfaces, right? So you get exactly the same problem that if you ignore interfacial energy, then the rate of perlite growth becomes infinite when the interlamellar spacing becomes zero. But when you take account of interfacial energy, you get a peak. Right, so we have a function here now of velocity versus radius. How would I pick the tip radius? How do I know which radius now the Wiedemann ferret will grow at? Yeah? What, what, what were you saying? Just do, don't worry, say it loudly. Hmm? No, no, there's no carbon here. This is, uh, you know a plot of velocity versus tip radius. If you had to choose a radius, what would you choose? I want to calculate the growth rate of Wiedemann farad otherwise I can't calculate microstructure, right? So if you had to pick a radius, what would you pick? Well, RC would give me zero growth rate, and I know that Wiedemann farad forms, right? Yeah, what did you say? The maximum. Yeah, so our natural tendency would be to say, you know, Wiedemann ferrite adopts the tip radius, which gives the maximum growth rate. Okay. Uh, now, fundamentally, I cannot justify that. All right, there's no fundamental justification, but it seems reasonable, and you have to test this by experiment, that the plate will pick a tip, ra tip radius which allows it to grow fastest. But there could be other criteria. For example the maximum rate of uh, free energy dissipation or the maximum entropy production or how stable is the interface. Yeah? Now, interface stability doesn't play a role in Wiedemann-Staden ferrite because the shape is determined by strain energy minimization. So we are lucky. But in the case of dendritic solidification, that's not true. It's solid forming in a liquid, so there's no strain energy. Right? So you have to look at other criteria as well. But if I show you a plot of the growth rate versus uh, measured and calculated growth rates, assuming that the plate tip radius will give you the maximum growth rate, yeah, then I think we are on the right track that you pick the maximum growth rate, as you said. Okay? So here's uh, the measured lengthening rate for every single point is a different steel. Right? Uh, and you do a calculation of growth rate, and there is a systematic error here, okay? Uh, but the measured growth rate is slightly faster than the calculated value, assuming the maximum growth rate. So obviously, you know, we are making various approximations like a parabolic cylinder shape and so forth and so on. So we don't expect to get exact agreement, but this is good enough for you to do calculations and design the steel if you want to get rid of Wiedemann ferrite or, or not. Yeah. So actually, we have covered quite a lot in today's lecture. We have completely dealt with Wiedemann ferrite, which is a, an important phase in almost all steels. It's important in several respects. First, that uh, it's not good for properties in the sense that it's a coarse microstructure, and therefore uh, it will not be as tough as a finer microstructure. Uh, and you know, you've got an equation for the growth rate, which has everything in it. It's got the average carbon concentration of the steel. Uh, it's got the phase diagram in it, C gamma alpha, C alpha gamma. It's got the diffusion coefficient, and it's got interfacial energy. So you can do the calculation for any steel. Because it's para-equilibrium, you don't need to worry about the partitioning of manganese, silicon, and you simply calculate a phase diagram. You can, with any of the softwares that you use or you can download, uh, you can force the substitutional atoms 
to remain frozen and calculate an ion carbon phase diagram. Yeah? And then plug in the numbers and you've got a calculated growth rate. I think that is my last slide, but let me check. Maybe there's a summary. Yeah, here we are. So the mechanism of transformation is displacive, but carbon must partition because we are operating at lower undercoolings, higher temperatures. And it's important that two plates grow together in order to account for a very low strain energy compared with bainite or martensite. And the cost of two plates growing together is that it's very difficult, it's more difficult to nucleate two plates simultaneously than one plate, and therefore you get a low nucleation rate and therefore a coarse microstructure. Okay. Everyone happy with that? Okay, that definitely, I think, is the last slide. So we are finished. Now, what I've done also is I've put all these uh, slide presentations on the EDX system. Okay, so you can take them as you wish. All right? Okay, and thank you for doing all the questions. I checked, and all the people who have registered have done the questions. And I would like to take a photograph because, you know, this is the class.